bad purgatory, though, funnily enough. It's not a bad way of... We can hear you, Donna, talking. Uh, <laughs> welcome on board and welcome on stage. We're very pleased to receive you. Welcome in the World Anthropocene Manifesto. Je vais parler en français dès à présent. Uh, I'll speak in French now, so make sure you are on the English channel if you don't understand French. So, we have entered the Anthropocene, we are the Anthropocene, we are Earth's community, we are living together through climate change, the acidification of the oceans, rising sea levels, extinction of species, pandemics, famine, soil pollution, wildfires, etc. We no longer control our impact. Everything around us is shifting. And whether we like it or not, we are exploring our own lives and environments anew. Different people have answered our question through our video messages, Henry and many others. This is session 10. We've been live uh, for 15 hours. We go on with our performance. The earth is spinning. We are on different timelines and very soon we will fly across the Atlantic Ocean, but we are still on the very last eastern time zone, a western, sorry, time zone of Europe. So we're speaking with Iceland, Ireland, saint pierre et Nicon, USA, uh, Gambia, Equatorial Guinea, Senegal, Ghana, Mauritania, and Portugal. Many countries are not present due to the hour, and we're a bit on our, on our own. So first of all, we will show you videos we have received in order to start the debate on this uh, manifesto, the global manifesto of Anthropocene. So let's start with the video clips. Shannock will Isaac Dina Carvostrodi, Torgi, Brusker, Coffer a Swine of Gohotul, August Fragri Don Tauki, I'm Shu, and Ardianka, August Mion, Otula, Kami de Obrula, Kela, Erson the Hoitia, Erfudden Hoitia, Kun Dawan Nua, Kofram, August Invunaha of Wintermock, Ta Iri Mok, Ektastol, Iri, Irigi, Irigi, Amakos Nalavaka, August Teramok, Fintua, Finspear, August Biawan, Leshan Dulra, Ashley, August Tour for Fragri Ditch. We say, what do we say to the planet? The first thing I think about is how we use plastic, although I don't really know enough about it and its recycling to be able to lecture anybody about it. So, what do you know about? I think. As individuals, we're always trying to survive. We're survivors. So I think the key to sustainability is to try and shift this survivalist individual to a survivalist collective. The default is always to think about ourselves first and then everybody else. I think individuals have to be forced to do certain things if they're going to be consistent. Sure, I'm the same. What about your project? I think it's the same with projects. Every project wants to be as sustainable as it can um, until things develop and our priorities get changed. For example, you might have a, a certain view that you want to frame, which mightn't um, align exactly with the ideal orientation from a solar game point of view. Or a building might have something, a particular job to do in a town. Um, it might need to be bigger than it actually requires to be or have a, have a larger mass. It's not always about saving money or importing granite from China instead of Portugal or Connemara or somewhere. Do you get me? Yes, Daddy. What are we doing the twin pro thing? I don't think you can mess with those kind of things, but there are things that um, are getting gradually better shifts which make choices much easier. If it costs the same, works the same, looks the same, but is more sustainable, then it's an obvious choice. I think that's what industry and government are trying to do. 
to create parity with levies, grants, and developing products. I guess what I'm trying to say is that when you're designing something, you just do your absolute best. Um, and if it's a good project or product, it'll be sustainable because people like it and um, it'll work better for longer. So, quality is sustainable. Yes, that's right. Humans should lead by example. À Saint-Pierre et Miquelon, l'anthropocène n'est pas qu'une hypothèse. À Saint-Pierre et Miquelon, l'anthropocène n'est pas seulement une hypothèse scientifique, c'est une expérience concrète. Vous pouvez avoir en écoutant les gens, c'est une sensibilité culturelle et il se réfère à une autre expérience exotique. Pas de palm tree, pas d'exotisme qui est promouvé par les colonial cultures. Modernité a impacté the land, the territory is saturated with modern promises of abundance and liberty. Fishermen from the Basque country were attracted to this land. And now Port Wasteland show the consequences of this attraction. The moratory on fishing stopped the business. It's a trauma that is social, cultural. Next step, climate change with storms, more and more violence, and living space flooded. In the west, Canada, St. Lawrence River, the north, Greenland, rocks, dry lands, dunes, rocky beaches, fast skies, when the weather is good, if not, cold, rain, snow, precipitations, and this is the life of the inhabitants of the island. Nothing to do with paradise that are out of modernity. Urbanization has used all the resources. Anthropocene here is another aesthetic experience of diversity. This is the emergence of the ruins of modernity we can see in the buildings because trying to build a new world is what humankind should seek if there is any time left. My dear brother, you're going to find me strange. I'm usually so fond of logic, so rational. Since my last postcard, my peregrinations have been numerous. I attended a boat blessing ceremony by fishermen of the Gulf of Mexico, the first ceremony since the devastation of the Hurricane Katrina. In New Orleans, I also participated in a voodoo flood prevention ritual. And then, I saw a play that was given in the middle of nowhere, in the heart of a bayou, the actors leaving the stage playing music in a boat, evolving under the silver garlands of Spanish moss. These three experiments impressed me very much. Each one revealed something deep about our relationship to the ground. Each opened new connections by a form of celebration. Each borrowed a little from the others in a form of continuum that I had never experienced so far. I understood that my inquiry should be oriented according to this scheme. The only one that could restore a continuity between my aesthetic experience of the landscape and the processes that shape my existence. 
In this movie postcard, you see me made up as a werewolf, as a rougarou, that is how the Cajun people call it. This staging is above all symbolic. Also, I can tell you that it is very exhausting to run in the skin of beasts under the summer climate of Louisiana. I left my old clothes of obtuse rationalists to better fill the soil and not to artificially elude the open conflicts that structure these new disputed territories that we inhabit. I tell you, we need a new land policy oriented to the earth, and this politics will be, at the same time, art. For these cosmograms, which we must describe by pursuing our inquiry, art makes us experience them, just as the science makes us put on them on the scale, little by little. I leave you know, my brother, I've made a bundle of all the rags of the old man and thrown them in the Mississippi. The Gulf Stream will carry them to the coast of England, and you can fish them out if you need a change of rags. Eh bien, nous venons de... So, I'm going to talk in English like that. We can be in communication all together. So, uh, we'll become like an English within the English channel and then they will be translated into French because as far as I believe, we all speak in English in here. So, let's move to another language which is none of our language actually in some way. So, uh, we have been glad to see like uh, these different videos that has been explaining to us the relation between the dad and his kid which is from Stephen Foley living in Spain and uh, original Ted from Ireland, another video from Donna Orling that is in here that has been talking about like the effect and perspec perspective answering to the question of the Anthropocene um, in a video. And then two other videos from Saint-Pierre and Miquelon that has been made by... Um, by oh, pa, 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 I'm losing my, my mind, Stéphane Cordobest. And the last one was by Mathieu Duperex about the old man rag. So let's uh, start in a way that I would like to, uh, to ask to uh, Donna to keep on going uh, in this idea that you started to, to think about what should be uh, another way of thinking about the Anthropocene. Is the Anthropocene a way uh, of criticizing the situation right now? Or do you think there are other ways? I think that uh, it's very important for us to kind of to I think understand that we have personal responsibilities here and that, that take ownership over this. And I think just listening to some of the last, uh, just the end of the last um, the last set of speakers, I think that I would very much agree with what Andrea said about, um, I think, kind of politics and, and where politics plays a role here. Because I think that there is, for instance, a lot happening at the grassroots and there really is a lot of, you know, participatory action in terms of collectives or, or coalitions of action coming together, trying to do things at a, at a place kind of level. But uh, in my experience, a lot of this hits political barriers, as we've heard kind of in, in uh, Spain and elsewhere. And I think that um, in a way, potentially this time we need to be kind of activist in our responses and realize that we have ownership over this problem and we need to come up with solutions. And I think one of the most interesting things for me that happened this week um, is around this GameStop um, kind of collective uh, disruption of the stock market. And I think that potentially we need to you know, be working in similar ways and, and, and I suppose kind of um, trying to be insurgent in terms of our activism um, uh, around the Anthropocene. How would you react, Andrew, towards this proposal that is doing this question of like going to a, towards a more activist perspective to in the Anthropocene? Is there some relation with you like all the way in Eastland? Oh, hello. Hi. Hi. 
Glad to see you. Welcome. Yeah, yeah thank you. And uh, thank you for these uh, videos. They were very inspiring. So uh, I think all social paradigm shifts come through activism. And it doesn't matter how far we go in history, uh, d democracy, women's rights, uh, human rights, uh, just, just everything we've seen during the last 100 years comes through activism, direct action, awareness campaigns, uh, shifting the center to a certain direction. Uh, in my case, I may be kind of uh, working with the language more than... Uh, th that is, in Iceland, we had, uh, we had direct activism a lot uh, kind of around the year 2000 about preserving the highlands of Iceland. And uh, so that was like nature protection on a, on a local level. Uh, but now, and then we did not think as much that, that is at that time you could protect a species by protecting a valley, protecting a cliff, uh, preventing road construction. But now you could say in the Anthropocene, you are not at, on the same place. That is, uh, you could protect the valley, but uh, the glacier vanishes from the end of the valley. Uh, the ocean uh, pH level changes from under the bird cliff. So, so suddenly you're seeing forces that are far beyond the national local uh, activist level where you could actually accomplish something in your local political sphere. Uh, you you kind of can't do that anymore in the same way in the Anthropocene, or you could say where where the human activity is shifting everything. That is all elements of water, where the glaciers are melting faster than in the last five thousand years. The water is rising faster than in the last twelve thousand years. Uh, the ocean pH level reaching a level not seen for fifty million years. So. So these forces call for a very globally connective uh, movement of activism, and maybe what like what we're doing here. That is, uh, I can't I can't preserve the protect the bird cliff without having, you know, a cross section of the planet with me at least, discussing how to do that. And I really hope that we can build this exchange in a way that we all relate. Uh, towards the action that we actually produce, because we can say it's activism, but it's all act action in changing uh, what we do believe around us. What I've been impressed like about what you're saying and towards the entire day that we are going through is all this feeling of uh, being in, in front of a fuzzy emptiness in some way, something that is indescriptable that I can't really understand. At the same time, it's kind of scary, but at the same time, I need to hold something that is around me to actually find out a way of communicating about what's going on, that my, the earth is under my feet, this is another body, this is a tree, or this is a plant, and we start to get connected. But beyond that, like, how do we deal with this? And Stephen, maybe can you uh, actually, because this is a gap we have also when we are facing this issue that we want to explain to a kid that is more or less two or three years old. And then you say, oh, let's discuss about what is the Anthropocene, which is your actual future. And how do you deal with this actual situation? Yeah, well, that's exactly right. I mean, um, when I really wanted to make a video, but it took me ages to try and figure out what I what I could talk about because um, it is really really fuzzy in my mind. Anyway, I don't think I think it's just like uh, Andrew was saying there. It's very very difficult for for one person to get a get a, a grasp of everything. Actually, we we can't see the whole world. It's impossible. You know, we only see this horizon, but actually it goes all the way around. You know, and it's always like that. Um, and when, when we're thinking about, you know, all of the manifestos, a lot of the manifestos we're kind of talking in, in, in kind of broader or global terms. Um, and I, I kind of felt when I was looking at those videos that I didn't really have the information that I really wanted to, um, to kind of put out there and say, well, this is, this is a certain, this is an investigation I was talking about. 
this is something um, that I know about that I want to share with the world. Actually, what I kind of wanted to share was this confusion I have in my head that it seems like that there's there is um, things that are contradictory and um, and in the end I kind of felt the easiest format uh, was was to 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 pretend that I was having a conversation with my four year old um, about this you know at this that he would be asking me um, just like Jerry was ask, is asking us um, what what do we say to the planet then um, then. I, we kind of start. I, I kind of start improvising then, um, and uh, yeah. I mean, it's not. It's 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 definitely not easy. Uh, the, I mean, I started out saying, "Well, I'd like to know more about waste and plastic, and I do do everything. I, like as an individual, I really I, I really try to reduce my waste as much as possible, and." Um, but I can't, I don't, I, I'm not at a stage where I can start preaching or, or come up with a solution as an architect to, uh, to tell people how to, to live properly and, and what's the best way um, of, of recycling or, or, or using or consuming um, so that the planet doesn't suffer from, you know, there's not a lot of all this crap that's left over after we've gone. Um, so, so really the only thing I can think about is, is, is when I'm actually faced with the, the problem of kind of thinking about the global um, versus the individual. And that's just through my projects. And, and even then I find a lot of, a lot of uh, um, contradictions or, well, seemingly opposing um, um, things. So yes, so really, um, Thank you, Stephen. Uh, for me, it's always very interesting to actually d develop this idea of like how do we deal with actually garbage that has been some kind of a subject for the entire day and uh, who is responsible for this. And that's an entire question, ba basically that we are all interrelated within this process, knowing the fact that behind the idea of the industry producing 80% of the waste that is actually produced, the responsibility of individual, of course, is very lower than the others. But the, the concept of like how do we actually care in it and how do we actually produce, produce it is quite also a participative process. But behind, we should not get into the responsabilization of stigmatizing a population because they use some kind of product since there are different levels. As you were saying, Donna, it's also quite of a political and an economical uh, issue where basically we have also to target uh, issues and we have to target enterprise. We have to target also a lot of different uh, level where actually facing up this problem cannot be only solved by individual. Basically, if I would say right now, if I go to a shopping market and then I still want to buy yogurt, you need a container. You need something that contain the milk or things that contain an element. And that's a big fight to take the responsibility of having only this. If you go to a shop and say, sorry, I just want what is inside. I don't care about what is around. This is your own responsibility. But then you take it and then you take it for yourself. And that's some kind of uh, interrelation process that at the end finish in a garbage and then it's your own responsibility to leave it to the others. Anyway, normally I'm not supposed to talk and that's late in the evening. So I've been talking quite a lot. So anyone want to react to, to this? Uh, I know that Hannes is still there. Donna, Andri, um, how can we actually face this interrelation problem and these issues that we were talking about? Do you want to ask question to all of you together? Actually, it's also a way of uh, starting a discussion because I'm always on stage. And basically, you can be the one that asks question to others. Well, um, I, I can take it from the yogurt part. Um, this Corona has, has taught us again that many things we could do at home, like the old the fashion of the sourdough bread. Well, I, I have been fortunate enough that my dear and beloved partner, she she's an amazing cook and she, she started making bread and it was fun and it was very good and we discovered new tastes and stuff. And also with yogurt, it goes the same way so that if you can get the milk, you can buy it in the glass bottle and mix it with the yogurt from yesterday, put it on the 
on a, on a, on a warm spot and get more yogurt. So um, again, it's a, we're dropping an ocean, but uh, that's the way it goes. So so it's it's up to us. So it's it's very important that we we spread the word that how things come up, how things are are being done. And uh, we can make a change here. It's a, it's a very small one, but but it is, yeah. Do you, do you guys think that um, because yeah, I'm interested in the yogurt as well. Thanks for making <laughs> your journey. Um, no, like I'd love to. You know, there there is a shop. There is a shop um, near my house where I can go and I can buy. There's about seven or eight things, and if I bring a bag, I can put the things in the bag and. You know, I can buy cereal and dry food and stuff like that. But yogurt, I don't, I don't know. I don't think, I think they sell yogurt. But um, I know I don't end up going there. Um, and I think, it, in a way, if we were all kind of forced, you know, we're not, in, we're all, we're not into being forced to do things either. But I think it is a thing of choice, and and the individual ends up, we end up using. Um, when it's an individual choice, we end up uh, thinking just about ourselves and how much time we have to do things and say, uh, maybe we don't have time to um, make our own yogurt. Um, so, and because uh, it's a drop in the ocean, as Yana says, um, we don't do it. And because, you know, we're, we're thinking about ourselves and not about the, the, the collective. So I don't know about you guys, um, but um, I find it difficult um, to even... Even wanting to do these things, I find it very difficult to go out and and and, and bring containers to shops and and the like. If, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to pick up on something that that um, Jan has just said there about, I suppose, how the coronavirus has maybe kind of forced uh, to take your words even different behaviours or behavioural change. And I think that one thing that the coronavirus uh, and this pandemic has shown us is that that political decisions are completely possible. You know, in most countries around the world, or in certainly in in well, definitely not around the world, excuse me, but certainly in um, in our neighbourhood, uh, UBI, universal basic income, is now um, being delivered by governments you know um cycling and uh is being given priority in terms of kind of our city centers decisions that you know are being made about how we live our lives that we've been told for years and years and years that that just can't be changed because of business or because for other reasons there's no money we've been we've learned through coronavirus that that that's not true and in fact actually we can do some things at, at this bigger scale um and and one thing in, in terms of, I suppose, the, what the the, um, the story about the yogurt kind of um, reminded me of was, was that uh, we have in our own, you know, his, histories and our own kind of like uh, local narratives, a lot of the answers for what, you know, for, 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 for what we're looking for. You know, they're um, certainly kind of in Central Europe and, and the Balkans, they've been coming up with magical uses for yogurt for a long time. And, you know, there's a history of kind of, you know, um, making every bit of the of the milk last and you know be you know kaimak or whatever you know and and using every single bit of of what's available and and i think that one thing that um that came up when I was listening to things today, and I understand that I'm kind of ranting a bit, um, is the importance of law, I think, in all of this. And um, in the eighth century, for instance, in, in Ireland, before, um, you know, enclosure and before we um, were conquered and, and uh, we all know about, about what happened there, but we had uh, environmental law um, codified in our in our own law, you know, as part of Brehan law, which protected, you know, certain species and there were pe- penalties kind of afforded to uh, environmental unsound practices uh, at, a, at a collective level and there was collective punishment for these things for for instance you know uh, picking a certain tree that will only kind of give fruit every three years or whatever which would um, do disservice to the collective and I think that we need to look into our our histories and, and find you know where how we've managed or mitigated scarcity before uh, and look at our language because a lot of the answers are already there and we just need to rediscover them. I don't think it's about necessarily reinventing the wheel. Yes, Andrew, can you keep on going? I can maybe um, throw some thoughts into that because uh, I was just uh, having this discussion with somebody about rationality and uh, in the light of the old law that 
that Donna was talking about mm -hmm. was that uh, the combined uh, uh, the, the combined uh, rationality of humanity that is our engineering our design our uh, our brilliance of the 20th century uh, the combined outcome of that is a disaster so uh, so actually uh, which is kind of uh, disappointing for us uh, that uh, that in the end, we are not more intelligent than an algae bloom. That is, we just grow into our resources and just, and then we fade away into another entropy or something. So, so that would be very disappointing if that would be, you know, if that would be our legacy. That uh, with Shakespeare and Mozart and nuclear bombs and everything, that in the end we were just like an algae bloom, collectively, and actually. Uh, we uh, we are kind of uh, so I was discussing holiness with my friend because uh, we used to have sacred sites that is we used to have sacred rivers sacred mountains sacred fields untouchable things and and that was all deemed irrational especially in the 20th century and and colonization and uh, colonizing Africa or, or or just colonizing even Ireland or whatever so so this. So that sacred was taken away and uh, and uh, and even demonized in some some cases. So so that's what we were talking about with Nemo Bassi in, on Monday. And uh, and actually, if half of Earth was holy, irrationally holy, that is, uh, if we had holy mountains and holy rivers, we would not be faced with uh, as many problems as we have now. So that was kind of a thought experiment. Was that uh, that uh, if we had to reinstall holiness, or, or, or I was just like thinking, like uh, you know, if at least half of Earth was untouchable, we we would have a stronger system than we have now in terms of climate and and stabilized glaciers and and things. So so uh, and it, I think the fuzziness is also because of. Uh, we don't really get the scale of things because we're making so uh, this uh, we're make, making items that are kind of uh, scattered and uh, chaotic. So uh, we were discussing cars, and when Elon Musk uh, uh, shot his car into space, which was a uh, Icarus-like stunt, uh, if everyone shot their car into space. Uh, we could make a circle around the planet, I think 10 circles around the planet every year, J just to get the scale of how big we are. Uh, we make we make uh, 100 million cars, and I think they would be like five meters long, so that's a, that's a length of 500 million meters. And in 2,000 two kilometers above above the ground, we could make 10 circles around the planet every year only of cars. So imagine if we had a, had a tyrant that would make one single item out of that, one single, one single monument. Uh, then we could maybe see the Anthropocene, that is, that is if, if one single tyrant would make something crazy on a planetary scale as a symbol of I have control over the planet. You know, I can make a, I can make a ring around the planet because I feel like it, or something like that. And it's like we're also scattered, and and we don't really get how powerful we are collectively. And and uh, so the, uh, but so I think in the next uh, fifty years we will have to create some kind of planetary infrastructures that. Uh, or maybe have not almost like terraforming infrastructures that, for example, suck CO2 out of the atmosphere that that just have to be some kind of five times the moon landing initiative on a global scale of, of just stabilizing CO2 or something. I, I, I'm quite sure we will we will see something like that, like uh, because it, it doesn't it, it probably needs some kind of a kind of mega projects of a scale that are not on an individual base but you know we can plant trees and we can't we can change our habits but but there are a hundred years of 
of uh, CO2 that has happened that we don't just, that nature can't really remove because uh, industry put it in, but, and, and the industry put it in on a, on a faster level than nature can breathe in or out. So, uh, yeah, that, that was my rant. So the idea was that, uh, that, that we are on a mythological place, actually, because uh, mythology is about the elements. That is, mythology is about, is about uh, when the moon and stars and, uh, are put, placed in the sky, it's when the sea was created, it's creation, destruction, it's the great floods. Uh, it's when the gods could discuss, you know, how long a life should be or something. You know, like, 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 like discussing the fundaments that politics are about uh, and history is about ideas, ideas and uh, ideas and. Uh, One of the problems with the ideas, though, I think, is that uh, the the kind of the conversation has been dominated by kind of um, you know Western ideas and Western solutions in relation to a lot of this stuff, and uh, we need to uncover other narratives from other places. You know, like um, I remember years ago, I was at this uh, symposium in New Zealand, and they were talking about fuzziness and about exactly what we're talking about here, and they were saying that in te Maori, in in the Maori language, that um, there is a kind of um, there's words for negotiating this fuzziness, which come from the kind of the Polynesian experience of, of you know, leaving an island kind of off the coast of, you know, in the South China Sea and arriving in New Zealand. And it was it's about kind of navigating um, with your balls. You know, I, I do apologize to translators and everyone here, but uh, in Maori, um, the, the idea is here is that you feel uh, when you're in a in a boat on your own in the sea, that you instinctively feel how to navigate the unknown, and you feel it inside yourself. And I think that we need to uh, remember how to tap into some of this this kind of uh, inherent um, understanding about how we live, kind of equitably with with other things on this planet. But how do you deal, guys? Like talking about uh, my myths, myth or talking about like different culturality and how do you deal with this alterity because like saying that my mythology or having like a sacred space i would rather say sacred because i don't know ex exactly how to deal with this idea that we should actually talk together within the end acceptance of a very high and intense difference with the others that we should link with, which is like a, one of the social inequality that we go towards, like if we talk about economy, but the same related to cultural difference and also myth and et ethnology. For the, this perspective, how would you deal with this? How do you see this mythology uh, as a tool to actually make an union, as you were saying, like uh, Andrew in some way? How would you actually think this? So the uh, the mythology is is kind of is kind of making us aware, actually, maybe of you know the, the 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 Anthropocene is a paradigm shift in how we can talk about what we can do. That is by both talk about what we have done, but then of course of what we can do. So so when I'm talking about mythology, is that. Uh, that Genghis Khan, uh, Ramses II, uh, Napoleon, they did not discuss sea level. You know, they did not meet on an international convention and discuss if the ocean should be one meter higher or lower. So, so, just, so just kind of, the idea was just to remind us that when we yawn at the next climate conference and feel like it's a, like a normal everyday boring thing happening, just to remind ourselves on how unprecedented this place is. You know, it's only like, uh, it's less than a lifetime since we actually understood that we could discuss sea level. That is, we're discussing how we're changing uh, oceans, no, glaciers into oceans. And we're discussing also the pH of the ocean. So on a normal earth, you would need really delicate uh, equipment to measure the difference of a sea pH of the ocean over a lifetime. Now you can use your taste buds and you can taste the difference of an ocean that is 8.1 in pH versus 7.7 .7 in pH. So uh, 
what I've kind of been doing in my work is is using this type of language to remind us that we are on a very strange and uh, and serious place, uh, which is mythological. That is, it is mythological that uh, that you can discuss the pH level of the oceans as a consequence of your legislations or your culture or your industries. And that a single human being will live a bigger change in the oceans than the previous 50 million years. 50 million years is 10 times the whole evolution of man. So a single human being take, can take like a Pepsi test over his life and, and changing the difference of the ocean. That, that, that is, that should not be possible. And and uh, so so the idea is that this takes us, this forces us to rethink all the ideologies maybe that were made before this, because this is just a different point of understanding us versus the the ground we're standing on or the oceans in front of us. Thanks for reminding us about the Pepsi test. I, I, I'm guessing the four of us all know what the Pepsi test was. Um, is this Coca-Cola? No, it's Pepsi. Um, no, I was. It reminded when you were talking about that. The um, I was thinking about they've got this. Um, you know, they've got the big the climate clock. Um, and and for me, I, I, I kind of you know that that's counting down to the the number of days to when. Um, where the, the situation is going to be irreversible and that. Um, and when I see the climate clock, um, um, I do kind of feel a little bit disengaged. Um, and I prefer thinking about if I was in a, you know, I'd love to live in a myth mythological era. Um, or even a kind of, um, I'm more interested in uh, like the, the impact, um, something beautiful happened, you know, something beautiful um, has on on people rather than something um, the kind of the stick or or something that's bad bad that's going to happen like like uh, when like fifty years ago or just fifty one years ago almost now um, uh, when when we saw when we saw the earth all was full you know um, uh, for the first time and then that kind of sparked a hippie movement um, and I know we've a lot of a lot of stuff has happened since then but it was kind of it was in, in in real terms, it's a bit like what Andrew was saying. Is that um, I think the, the the vision of something collective, um, or you know, um, or our, our collective achievements. I mean, I know the the Earth was there before we were, but um, other things, um, say like the, the pyramids and that, uh, or, or when you go when you go to you know to an amazing place, you want to protect it then because you've seen it, rather than seeing um, a, lot of, a lot of images of of all of the horrible stuff we're doing. Um, I think it's just giving giving value to the to to the amazing place that we're we're looking to inhabit. Um, I think has has a very strong effect. May I ask? Uh, probably, is que Thomas, you would like to interact? Yeah, here is the coordinator. Thomas, would you like to react? In here with us. Um, may I? I've seen you that you want to probably react. Please. Thomas Boutreux, uh, from France and doing research in oui, il y a plusieurs uh, choses qui m'ont qui m'ont beaucoup inspiré dans ce qu'on So certain things inspired me a great deal and uh, inspired me in what we've been talking about. Uh, we, we've been talking about something you could term as cosmology. What I found very interesting was the testimony that reminds us that a few hundred years ago, we had uh, ways of protecting nature. We turned this uh, notion of the sacred into laws. We talked about experience uh, in the Pacific. This is somewhere which I know quite well. I've been, I worked in tropical forests, and a lot of societies in these areas have a full social organization, comprehensive organization, which is based on respect for the natural environment and a, a tribal system. Uh, with the tribal system, each tribe has a totem, which is a different species, which creates uh, a way of organizing society in which everyone protects a particular, each tribe protects a particular species. 
So are we uh, so the idea would be to protect what is wild, to try and avoid pillaging natural resources, uh, placing responsibility for this on different populations. Uh, there's also the idea of domestication and restoring the wild nature of certain species. This is something that's uh, one of the most important challenges of our of the Anthropocene. We have tried to domesticate almost every animal in the world, from a square of grass in front of our house, uh, all the way to uh, the, the cow herds, which are fed with soya, uh, even domesticated lions uh, in some countries. So we have to uh, really move away from domestication and, and move back towards creating, uh, restoring the wild nature of species. Another thing I want to talk about is the loss of sensitivity and of aesthetic experiences and physical links with nature. Uh, we've lost this over a f the last few generations because the main effect of anthropology the Anthropocene is the urbanization of the world, and in three generations we've gone from one quarter of people living in urban areas to, uh, to the vast majority. So our grandparents maybe were lucky to be able to perceive certain things differently. But the, what is unfortunate is for the young urban people uh, uh, have not been able to experience nature in the same way as uh, their forefathers. So trying to restore contact with the ordinary and to get closer to uh, nature. And what I dream of is a transition from individual actions uh, ecological transition from individual actions uh, is to go beyond our houses and to uh, uh, carry out collective action with those who live nearest to us, those who are not in our home but who are our neighbors. We have heard uh, people talk about activism and spaces. Uh, uh, and activism based on proximity and creating uh, natural spaces outside our own homes, uh, which could be done through collective action within, uh, between uh, earthlings who live in the same uh, Close, uh, the same area in a, in a city or uh, elsewhere, small micro projects like this could help us go further in this area. Thank you for your testimony. We have five minutes left before next session. Then I would like to ask you roughly uh, what would you be the point that you would suggest to develop this Anthropocene uh, manifesto? What would be the points that we should target it first? If we can try, at least. Donna first, please. Uh, so just listening to um, to Thomas there, just kind of sum up and, and feedback on us uh, with my kind of um, the limited French, I suppose, since what I had on Erasmus. Um, one thing that comes to mind to me is to kind of is the work of Guy Debord uh, in your uh, fantastic um, country there and the situationless. And I'm just wondering if we could maybe cultivate a movement that kind of uh, promotes planet as a spectacle and nature as a spectacle and how, for instance, the, you know, beauty that exists and, and you know, that uh, we are so, so um, privileged to be kind of uh, have access to to, can we kind of celebrate this more as a tool to communicate some of the kind of uh, cosmologies or, 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 or narratives, for instance, that Andrew is saying, and 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 uh, and use kind of um, nature itself to, as a didactic tool to kind of help us kind of uh, imagine some very complex solutions to to where we're going and. And if we can, you know, map our way through those. What about you, then, Stephen? We have like two minutes fifty more, so fifty seconds for you, fifty for each, and Hannes at last. No, I think I think Thomas should um, should should make a summary of of each uh, of the next hour as well, because he did it very well. Um, no, I'd, I'd be interested in kind of talking about listening to the next session about choices, what people, the choices the the, the choices people make on an individual basis, um, because we have. We have a certain, um, we aspire to be certain people, but in the end, 
Um, it's the choices that we're given um, that end up um, uh, destroying or, or, or improving our environment. So that's all. Andrew? Mm, well, uh, I don't have a 50-second <clears throat> solution. Uh, I, think, I know, uh, that's why we try. <laughs> I think this will... Uh, I think uh, if you talk to a 15-year-old, but then you can tell him that all his working life will be about this. And it doesn't matter what field he or she chooses. All his working life is about this challenge. Everything he chooses will be... This is the center kind of uh, theme of all design, all work, everything, politics, you name it. So let's make this with Hannes and then I think we are just about to end. Janes, please, we're listening to your point. Yeah, that, that's right. And I think we, we have to uh, give our hopes as, as the planet is going by the hockey stick uh, graph downwards i think uh, we ought to put our hopes into the um, development of uh, the science and and hope that the energy thing gets solved uh, with exponential uh, speed and at the same time that we ourselves do as much as we can and make as much as uh, as much of such meetings in, in, in all sorts of ways that we can. Um, thank you. I think that's a lot. Thank you, Ranes. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Donna, for such a nice conversation with all of you at 11 at night, uh, kind of, more or less, for, for some of you. It's fantastic for to finish with uh, all the sentence that you were saying about choices, hopes, don't give up in a way. And that's the thing we should keep on going for this manifesto and the way that we'll get connected together. Because we have not so much chance to mix up uh, individual as we are right now. But one thing that we have in front of us is the vital energy that will keep on going. Whatever we produce, even is to make round of the circle with cars in the in the in the in the in the outside, which is wrong, we can do the reverse. And that was a, an also very interesting message. We can build walls, but we can also build walls too. We can build even more than this uh, within 50 years and transform quite a lot of things. So thank you very much for your input. And uh, we keep on going with the session 11. And I uh, was very touched to have you tonight, knowing that one thing that is hard for us also is to deal this problem with our personal life at the same time and the emotion that we have and then all the things that goes to this is all about life and then we deal with it take care thanks guys